Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about SRV6 BE. Well, BE refers to best effort. SRV6 BE is a mode in which an SRV6 path is established to forward traffic in best effort mode. Comparatively speaking, SRV6 BE does not have the traffic engineering capability. However, SRV6 deployment is simple. Superficially, to provision services, you need to deploy SRV6 only on the ingress and egress of the involved network. Note also that SRV6 is compatible with common IPv6 devices on live networks. Such advantages have led this mode to gain popularity and be widely deployed in the early stage of SRV6 development. As networks develop, we can upgrade transit nodes as needed, and then deploy SRV6 TE policies to implement traffic optimization with the help of controllers. Today, our course focuses on one of the most common scenarios: BGP L3 VPN V4 over SRV6 BE. BGP mentioned in this course refers to MPBGP, which is short for Multi-Protocol Extensions for BGP. In this course, we'll refer to a network with five devices. P1, the P, and P2 are all public network devices that belong to AS100. A bidirectional SRV6 B path needs to be established between P1 and P2 to carry BGP L3 VPN V4 services. In this example, IPv4 is deployed between each PE and its connected CE. The overall configuration process consists of three steps. First, enable ease-ease on P1, the P, and P2 to achieve basic root reachability. Then, establish a bidirectional SRV6B path between B P1 and P2. Finally, configure VPN instances and CE access on P1 and P2, and establish a BGP VPN V4 peer relationship between P1 and P2 to advertise routes between the CEs. In SRV6 BE scenarios, SRV6 does not need to be configured on a P device. To facilitate understanding, we'll obtain packet headers from this interface of P1 for packet parsing. Let's start by looking at how to configure ESIS, which consists of both global and interface-specific configurations. Global configuration involves several commands, of which the most important is enabling the independent IPv6 topology through the IPv6 enable command. Now, let's look at interface-specific ESIS configuration. For this, we need to enable ESIS on all interfaces on the public network side. ESIS also needs to be configured on the loopback interfaces of P1 and P2 so that the two loopback interfaces can communicate. The addresses of the loopback interfaces can then be used to establish a BGP VPN V4 peer relationship later. And they can also be used as the source addresses for SRV6 BE encapsulation. ECE's configuration methods are practically the same across all SRV6 BE scenarios. Next, let's take a look at ECE's root calculation. After basic ECE's configurations are complete on P1, the P, and P2, ECE's completes neighbor relationship establishment through hello messages and LSDB synchronization through LSPs. After an LSDB is generated, ESIS uses the SPF algorithm to calculate routes. When observing ESIS route information on P1, we can see that the information consists of interface addresses and subnet route information. Next, let's configure SRV6, which only needs to be configured on P1 and P2. To do this, enable SRV6 globally. Configure a source address for SRV6 encapsulation, and then configure a locator. Because locators are rootable in SRV6, they typically need to be unique in the SRV6 domain. However, in some multi-node protection scenarios, it's acceptable to configure the same locator. 
In this command, static32 indicates that a static segment is reserved for configuring static seeds. The two numbers 64 and 32 add up to 96. If we then subtract 96 bytes from 128 bytes, 32 bytes remain for dynamic seeds. After global SRV6 configuration is complete, the device needs to advertise SRV6 information through ECS. After the segment routing IPv6 locator command is run in the ECS view, ECS advertises SRV6 locator routes. In SRV6 BE scenarios, AND and AND.x seeds, which are used to represent paths, are not used. Therefore, we can disable ECS from dynamically generating seeds to save device resources. After SRV6 is configured, ECS advertises SRV6 information through LSPs. According to the LSP format, we can see that the rotor capability TLV carries SRV6 capability information, the SRV6 locator TLV carries locator information, and the IPv6 interface address TLV carries interface information. In addition to multi-topology reachable IPv6 prefix information, the multi-topology reachable IPv6 prefix TLV also carries locator root information. Because this TLV is relatively old, it can be identified by common IPv6 devices enabled with ECs. By contrast, the SRV6 locator TLV is an SRV6 specific TLV and therefore can be identified only by SRV6 devices. If both of the two TLVs exist in an ECS LSP, ECS selects the multi topology reachable IPv6 prefixes TLV to install locator routes. However, because the old TLV does not carry algorithm information, the locator information carried in the SRV6 locator TLV needs to be used to install routes in flex algo scenarios. In addition, because ECs have been disabled from dynamically generating seeds, this ECs LSP does not carry SRV6 AND or AND.x seeds. After SRV6 configuration is completed, ECS updates the LSDB and then uses the SPF algorithm to calculate routes. When observing the ECS routing table on P1, we can see two new routes, P1's locator route and P2's locator route. Now let's take a look at the ECS routing table on the P. We can see that the P has also learned the two locator routes, even though SRV6 is not configured on it. As such, the P can also properly forward SRV6 packets after receiving them. This explains why SRV6 BE can be deployed together with common IPv6 devices. Now that we've completed SRV6 BE configurations, let's look at BGP-related configurations. First, configure a VPN instance on P1 and P2. Bind the VPN instance to the specified interface and configure an IP address for the interface. Then, configure routing information exchanges between each PE and its connected CE. The exchanges can be implemented using a range of protocols, such as IGP, BGP, and static routing protocols. This example uses eBGP. On the CE, eBGP is configured in the IPv4 unicast address family view. During BGP configuration on the CE, local routes can be imported to BGP. On the PE, enable the peer relationship with the corresponding CE in the BGP IPv4 VPN instance address family view. After completing these configurations, we need to configure an n.dt4 seed for the specified VPN instance in the SRV6 view. The configurations on P2 are similar to those on P1. In this example, an ant.dt4 seed is manually configured. Note that this operation is optional. If it's not performed, you can use BGP to dynamically allocate an ant.dt4 seed. After an ant.dt4 seed is configured, it's added to the local seed table. 
in the local seed tables on P1 and P2. We can see that the EN.DT4 seeds are bound to VPN instances. Funk type is displayed as end.dt4 for these seeds. Each end.dt4 seed consists of a locator and an opcode. The locator is rootable and directs a data packet to the corresponding PE, and the opcode helps the PE identify the specific VPN instance. In a conventional BGP IP MPLS VPN scenario, two labels need to be used to achieve these two functions. In an SRV6 scenario, however, only an end.dt4 seed of the IPv6 address format is needed. Next, let's look at how we can establish a BGP VPN v4 peer relationship between P1 and P2. First, Enable the device to exchange routes with the specified peer in the IPv4 VPN v4 address family view. The peer is an IPv6 one, which is different from the peer type in BGP IPv6 MPLS VPN scenarios. Then, enable the device to exchange prefix seeds carried by VPN v4 routes with the specified IPv6 peer. These prefix seeds are end.dt4 seeds. After that, perform configurations in the BGP IPv4 VPN instance address family view. Specifically, associate the locator with the VPN instance address family and add the seed attribute to the BGP VPN v4 routes to be advertised. If a manually configured end.dt4 seed does not exist, a dynamically allocated one can be used instead. Finally, Enable root recursion to SRV6BE based on the seed attribute carried by VPN v4 roots. In this command, the keyword best effort indicates BE. After the preceding configurations are completed, the devices exchange open messages to establish a BGP peer relationship and use keep alive messages to maintain it. Once the peer relationship is established, the devices exchange update messages carrying path information and an LRI. Next, let's look at the BGP update message format. The message has some common path attributes, including origin, as path, met, local pref, and extended communities. The extended communities attribute carries the root target that is, the VPN target configured for the VPN instance. In addition, the BGP update message carries a BGP prefix seed, which is actually an end.dt4 seed configured on P2. In the NLRI, we can see that the main address family identifier is IPv4. The sub-address family identifier is labeled VPN unicast. And the next hope of the root is the address of the loopback interface on P2. The carrot RD is that configured for the VPN instance on P2. And the root prefix is the prefix of the root advertised by C2. P1 generates a BGP VPN v4 routing table based on received BGP update messages. From the routing table of the VPN instance in VPN v4, we can see the route advertised by CE2. The next hope of the route is the routeback interface address of PE2. According to the route details, we can see more information, such as the RT and prefix seed, that is the end.dt4 seed of the corresponding VPN instance. The preferred BGP route enters the IP routing table. Therefore, we can also see the root of C2 in the IP routing table. The command output shows that the root has successfully recursed to an SRV6B path. In addition, the next hope of the root has been changed to the end.dt4 seed of the VPN instance configured on P2. And the outbound interface is displayed as SRV6BE. The value of the flex field is RD, where R indicates relay and D indicates download to FIB. The BGP route on P1 is sent to C1 through the peer relationship, 
so the BGP routing table on C1 contains this route. The preferred BGP route on C1 then enters C1's IP routing table, which means that the IP routing table on C1 contains this route. After we run the ping command on C1 to ping C2, the ping operation succeeds, indicating that the configuration is successful. Now that we've introduced the control plane implementation of BGP L3 VPN V4 over SRV6BE, let's look at how packets are encapsulated during forwarding. In this example, a ping is initiated from C1 to C2 to simulate packet encapsulation. First, C1 sends a ping packet, which is an ICMP request packet to C2. IPv4 encapsulation is first performed on C1 for the ICMP request packet, using C1's address as the source address and C2's address as the destination address. After receiving the packet, P1 performs SRV6 encapsulation using the source address configured on P1 as the source address and the next hope of the involved route as the destination address. We can see that the route has successfully recursed and its next hope is the end.dt4 seed on P2. The information shows that the SRV6BE packet is not encapsulated with any SRH, meaning that SRV6BE does not have the traffic engineering capability. The information on the right shows the encapsulation format of an ICMP reply packet sent from C2 to C1. The encapsulation format is similar to that of an ICMP request packet. Before we finish this course, let's summarize the VPN route advertisement and data forwarding processes. To achieve route advertisement, C1 and P1 establish an eBGP peer relationship. The BGP routes on C1 are then advertised to the VPN interface specific routing table of P1 through the eBGP peer relationship. Routes in the VPN interface specific routing table automatically enter the VPN v4 routing table. Unlike the implementation in an eVPN L3 VPN v4 scenario. After the routes in the VPN v4 routing table are advertised to P2 through the BGP VPN v4 peer relationship, they are automatically imported to the VPN interface specific routing table of P2 based on RT information. Then the routes in the VPN instance specific routing table of P2 are sent to the BGP routing table of C2 through the eBGP peer relationship. Finally, the preferred route in the BGP routing table of C2 enters the IP routing table for forwarding. Moving on, let's look at the data forwarding process. We'll still use packet sending from C1 to C2 as an example. Let's assume that C1 sends a common IPv4 packet to P1. After receiving the packet through the interface bound to the specified VPN instance, P1 searches the routing table of the VPN instance based on the destination address in the packet finds the associated next hope information, performs SRV6BE encapsulation, and then forwards the packet to the P. After this packet arrives, the P searches the public network IPv6 routing table based on the outer destination address and forwards the packet to P2, which then searches the local seed table based on the outer destination address and finds a matching n.dt4 seed. As instructed by the seed, P2 removes the IPv6 header, finds a matching VPN instance, searches the IPv4 routing table of the VPN instance, and then forwards the packet to C2. That's all for the implementation of BGP L3 VPN v4 over SRV6BE. Based on the preceding introductions, SRV6BE can be implemented only through IGP and BGP extensions. In addition to provisioning services, we only need to configure SRV6 on the ingress and egress of the involved network. And the transit nodes are only required to support IPv6 forwarding. As such, SRV6 offers excellent compatibility with live networks. 
That's all for today's course. Thank you for watching. See you next time.